Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of professional wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie, and, and uh, I'm glad that we're back together. It seems like it's been a long time. Glad to be back with you. I know you had more than your fair share of travel issues. We certainly oh. planned to record last Thursday, and boy, you wound up spending the whole day at the airport in Charlotte, but you made it back, had a successful venture with uh, high spots and their signings. and. If you've never been a part of one of those sign it live gimmicks that Mr. Bikikio does from high spots, you're missing out. They're uh, pretty entertaining, pretty fun, and a really cool opportunity to get some, uh, unique stuff signed. What was your experience like with high spots? All positive. Uh, Michael's uh, very organized, very smart. Uh, he's got a good team, which is so important as you know, but even though you have bull, uh, you know, you're just soft hearted. Yeah, I am. Uh, uh it was good. A good day. We sold a lot of merchandise. People were coming out of the woodwork, sending things to sign, uh, getting, th get, you know, buying things online. It was cool, man. It was good. He's got, he's very well organized. you after all these years of doing appearances in one form or another, you really, uh, appreciate and notice when someone like Michael is, uh, at the head of the head of the table. And, uh, is or have, have been things organized. It takes so much off the talent, not to have to worry about a getting paid, getting picked up at the airport, find a place to have lunch, all the important shit. It's, 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 you know what I'm saying? You know, I got into a deal the other day. Listen to the, what was I listening to? Some interview on sports, sports center. Maybe I know, I can't believe how overused the term. You know what I'm saying is, oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Know what I'm saying? Something else. Anyway, but it was good. And I enjoyed being in Charlotte. I, I, I was there a day longer than I wanted to be. That's nobody's fault, but mine, I guess. And, and so that's how we, how I look at it anyway, but it's good. I, and, uh, for all of those of you that bought something and, and I'm sure it's already been shipped, uh, is uh, a good thing. We appreciate your business and support. Well, we, uh, we're going to be talking about SummerSlam from way back when today, SummerSlam 2004, that's our topic, but it's a big week because we know in just a, a little bit of time here, as folks are listening, actually, Jim, you're mid flight right now going across uh -huh. the pond. Of course, last night folks tuned in and saw a dynamite from Cardiff, Wales, an international dynamite. Uh, pretty rare, uh, maybe not if you count Canada, but still, yeah. goodness, goodness gracious, this is a uh, a home stretch for all in Wembley 2.0. Around fifty thousand tickets out so far, and a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement, a lot of hype. What are you looking forward to about all in this weekend? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, Brian Danielson uh, challenging Swerve Strickland for the uh, AEW title. Uh, I'm sure it's going to go on last. I'm sure. Where else would it go? Uh, but I, I am looking forward to that because I'm calling it. And I think that's the only match I'm calling is uh, that main event. But there are a lot of main event level matches booked. Uh, loaded card. You know, you saw that. Hey, Bull, put that graphic back up with the talent, would you? Uh, there's a lot of talent right there. Yeah. A lot of talent right there. And so I'm uh, excited about that. And it's funny how they've got uh, Will Ospreay positioned in the middle. Maybe at one time he was going to combat, combat uh, Swerve and they were going to close the show. I but think that I, graphic was originally made before MJF was even back. MJF's not even on the poster here. So, oh my God, don't get that started. It could be a chaotic. No, I'm just saying that's, a, that's an early uh, poster. Yeah. But my point was going to be that I didn't make very well. There's a lot of really good talent in that poster. Oh yeah. There really is. There's no reason this show shouldn't be dynamite pay-per-view. Uh, you know, there's, there's nothing like being there live. I can promise you that we all know that. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the whole thing. I'm looking forward to having, uh, my beans for breakfast. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I know. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I ain't. You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. I, I, I hate to uh, break up our fun and our funny ha-ha, but I know that since you and I sat down, 
man, I hate this expression, but we've all heard it, that deaths come in threes. And unfortunately, we lost three members of our little wrestling community, Mr. Kevin Sullivan, Mr. Dennis Brent, and off of the Wild Samoan. I know that you were perhaps closest with Dennis Brent. Yeah. Maybe some of our younger listeners aren't familiar with the name. Can you catch everybody up about the impact that Dennis Brent had on wrestling and certainly your life? There's old Dennis. Dennis could grow a mustache in about 30 minutes. Uh, good guy. His, his uh, wife, Lynn, Dr. Lynn Brandt, she's a, I hired a person with a doctorate, but I hired both of them. And uh, De- Dennis was doing some magazine work, compiling, laying out, all that stuff. Uh, uh, some, some stuff for Fritz, Von Eric, and Cowboy. And that's how I got to know Dennis through Cowboy, basically. And uh, I think Cowboy kind of shoved Dennis over to my side of the room, and it was good. I made a lifelong friend, so it was a it was a good transition. Uh, but Dennis was really smart. The only, only issue Dennis had, he was a Texas graduate, uh, but he he didn't say much about that. At my insistence, you know, make me vomit. Uh, but he's a, he's a great guy. And uh, he had, uh, I think he actually died of a brain tumor. So, uh, the boy had d- disease list each July, man. He had multiple, I think he had, was it multiple sclerosis or multiple, multiple. Yeah. He had MS. That's right. MS. Yeah. So he was a good dude, man. And I don't, I, he reminded me a little bit of the Fink, hmm. Howard Finkel. In as much as that, I've never met anybody that was a non wrestler that was as big a fan of the business as uh, Dennis was. And like I said, it reminded me of Howard. Couldn't get enough of it. Couldn't get enough. Couldn't talk enough about it. Couldn't write enough about it. He just was a, a good dude in that respect. So, uh, yeah, Dennis passed and, and uh, he was a little older than me, but he, I, I, you think about your mortality when your friends start dying. Uh, so, but Dennis is a good dude, good dude. And I'm, he, he'll be missed. Uh, he had several friends in the business. I think Terry Taylor and he were real good buddies. Mm. So I don't know if that speaks to his character or not, but no I'm kidding. Joke, joke bull. That's where you put the last track in. Ha ha. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Kevin Sullivan was one of the most unique minds in, that I ever encountered in wrestling as a booking person, a booker. Uh, really good. Really good. You don't have to like all of his ideas, but he was organized. He tried to do something different. The, the process that he always engaged in was spot on. Did he use the right color blue when he was painting? I don't know. Depends on what you, what color blue you like. And he was just a good, good creative guy. I remember one of my favorite stories about Kevin Sullivan. We had a big event in Baltimore in the Crockett days. And uh, Gary Jester, one of the great promoters in our business, uh, promoted the event because he was, that was his town. So uh, everybody was really drinking. And the Nates was there, uncensored. Need not go any farther in this story. There's a penis involved in this somewhere along the way. And uh, Sully, Sully Lee, Flair, comes, of course, comes out with his robe on and nothing else. His, uh, his uh, cast, cast length socks, high dollar shoes, and an erection. Under his robe, of course got to be civil and uh so Sullivan's going to top that sully goes to the men's room he's got a robe he puts his robe on he finds a uh because it was somebody's birthday that night i can't remember who it was maybe chester's wife but anyway he found a another he found a, a available uh birthday candle and he put the birthday candle into his foreskin so it would hold it in place. Uh, And uh, I can't relate to that, Conrad. I don't know about you, but I can't relate to that that 
that uh, that poor skin thing. Because mine got taken from me as a child. So uh, Kevin goes to the bathroom, comes out. He's got the candle lit and and captured into his foreskin. That's our visual. Yeah, that's it. It's a true story. And everybody was so drunk that nobody protested. Nobody doth protested too loudly. So, but uh, that was the old days when there was no HR and all that stuff. We just just freewheeling and outlaws. But Sully was good. I, I and he was good about explaining things. You know, for an announcer, I don't need to know every single step along your your journey. But what helps me if I know what emotions you're looking to elicit during the broadcast? What what points are imperative to make? Now, generally, I figure that out before we start. But you always like to pick the brain of the guy that's put it down on paper. And Sully was really good at explaining what he wanted. He was, he was a professional, and he was he wasn't rude. He was just a he was a good dude. What was his illness? Did you know? Yeah, I don't think I should probably discuss all that, but he's okay. uh, no longer with us, and unfortunately, neither is Alpha. Man, I just hate that these things happen in threes. You know, his Alpha's reputation in wrestling has seemingly grown with the success of the Bloodline angle, but. I mean, you take yeah. a look at his work, not just in the ring, because that's really what's talked about a lot these days, but as a trainer, my goodness, it's a who's who that Alpha had a hand in helping become megastars in the pro wrestling business, right? Yeah, absolutely. He had a lot of influence on a lot of, a lot of successful people. You know, uh, to me, that's always been kind of a sore spot with me because, not him, uh, but the, the fact that you know, people talk about, well, I signed that guy and I signed it. some of us that signed more than others, but you really judge those signings by the success of the guys you signed. You know, like I've said before, Connie, you know, I always wanted to have, uh, a, uh, a roster of guys that, that wanted, that wanted to be great and didn't want to settle for anything but a main event at WrestleMania and that accompanying pay, uh, payoff. That's, that's where you find that's where the rubber meets the road, uh, how well you do in your post signing life. And, uh, we were lucky in that regard. Some of those guys I signed, they're still making money. Isn't that amazing? The wrestling business is so resilient. They're still making money, Connie. Yeah. You know, I, I saw a thing, uh, where sting is going to be uh, making a, a great appearance at the cauliflower alley club. I'd love to go to the Cauliflower Club. It's one of my favorite events. It's a great organization. But I'll be on an airplane. Right. And it, it upsets people that I can't, uh, I didn't commit to it, but I'd like to, really like to have gone. And I think maybe one of these days, uh, sooner than later, I'll be able to do things like that uh, a little bit more freely. And that's, I'm looking forward to that, those days because I enjoy those events. I enjoy meeting the fans, the longtime fans. I've got, always got great stories and swag. You know, uh, they show me pictures of me doing something that I had never seen before type thing. I like that. It's, I don't know if it's an ego-driven deal, Connie, but just part of the journey. It goes along with what I've been doing for 50 years. So uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, Sully was just a, he's a, he had a unique mind. You know, he was well read. He was smart. He loved the Red Sox. My God, did he love the love the Red Sox? And uh, he did. He did well there. Now, you you mentioned uh, Alpha. God bless his soul. Uh, I'm. I first met the Samoans in Mid South Wrestling. Cowboy brought him in, and I actually went to the airport, picked him up. It was, uh, and I don't. I don't know what happened. Somebody got into a row a hay rube and, uh, in the airport, I think somebody was making fun of their attire and that didn't, that didn't go down well. And so, uh, they, I was outside in the car waiting. You could do that then. And here they, here comes this guy running out of the airport, Tulsa. Well, there's look at sheer fear on his face. 
and 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 behind him a few steps were Alpha and Sika. And uh, I remember somehow or another, uh, I always thought it was the guy, uh, not Alpha and Sika, but it could have been. But they the cops found a joint, significantly sized joint. And uh, I always said it was the other guys. But uh, they were professional, and they didn't talk or act like they looked. I've always found this to be fascinating about pro wrestling. I uh, I hate that we're starting the show on such a down note, but boy, we lost three important members of our little wrestling community, and Kevin Sullivan, Dennis Brent, and Alpha. I wanted to uh, start the show off with a conversation about that. Yeah. Uh, we should also mention there was some big news that happened since you and I recorded. It's already been announced that All In, the AEW equivalent of WrestleMania, if you will, is going to be in Texas next year. Arlington, here we come. Saturday, July 12th at Globe Life Field where the Texas Rangers play baseball. My goodness, what a big week this is going to be. And the rumor and innuendo is this is going to be a uh, very, very big event. I'll just say that. Uh, what have you heard about all in Texas? You got to be pumped, man. That close to home. That's going to be a, a day trip for you from Oklahoma. I'll probably be back in Oklahoma by then, Connie. Actually, good point. Uh, I think it's good. You know, there's a, there's a huge fan base there. Uh, it's a, it's a drivable trip for a lot, thousands of fans. Uh, and you know, all those guys got rich running the Texas territory. Paul Bosch, uh, Fritz, Joe Blanchard, and, and others I'm leaving out inadvertently. Uh, so uh, I think it'll be, I think it'll be very successful. Now, obviously, it depends on the card and how the, how the card is built, but it should do really well, don't you think? I think it's going to be a home run, and I can't wait to see it. I know that uh, a lot of AEW fans are really excited that. All in is going to be stateside, but I have a feeling that Tony Khan is going to have something cool up his sleeve for uh, next year across the pond. Before we get into our topic today, SummerSlam 2004, Jim, I want to ask you, I mean, can you imagine going from being a wrestling fan to appearing at WrestleMania to being a part of one of the highest rated segments of all time, all within the span of a few weeks? Now that sounds make believe, but it's in reality the real life story of the Mean Street Posse's Pete Gas, who joined us recently on an episode of The False Finish over at adfreeshows.com. Let's take a listen. So the Tuesday, Tuesday the ratings come out. And Rodney and I are at TVs, but we're gone, right? We're not we're not there, but they kept us there for the night or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden we're driving home and I'm driving and Rodney's riding shotgun and the phone rings, his phone rings and it's Shane. And he says, put me on speaker so gas can hear. And he, all of a sudden you hear boys, you know, it's Vince. He says, I just want to tell you that the ratings came out. You guys are the number one, are the highest rated segment in cable history for wrestling. And then he goes on to talk about Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, all the guys stone cold rock. All those guys and our ratings were the higher in that 15 minute segment. Yeah. Than them. Right. I mean, talk about a holy shit moment, right? Yeah, for sure. So, and you're getting it from Vince. Right. Right. So I mean, I, did I have goosebumps on my arms talking about it? You know, you it's, just, it's an amazing, yeah. You know, I just, and, um, you know, Vince is no dummy. He, he saw it there. So we thought it was over. Right. So. You know, the locker room, they were all so good to us when we were there, you know, then we leave and then sure enough, about a week later or whatever, Shane calls us back in his office again. But this time he's got two manila envelopes. Mm. We're like, what the hell's that? He's like, we want to offer you guys three one-year contracts. And Conrad, I took that fucking contract and I went out and I went down into the garage at Titan Tower. And I screamed as loud as I could, man. That was the greatest feeling in the world. Hey, he should have been screaming. They they came at the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, uh, Pete Gass and Rodney and Shane were all in high school together in Greenwich. And they played on the same high school football team and junior high team. They'd been around each other their entire lives. So, uh, 
it was one of those, it was an eye rolling moment that became a jaw dropping moment. The eye rolling moment was when we heard that, uh, Shane had gotten his, his boys, a uh, spot. And, uh, you know, I, I felt somewhat uncomfortable about it because they're green and there's so many guys that were more talented, uh, in essence than they were, that were trying to get work. And so anytime you don't hire some, somebody, it offends their friend who may be already on the roster. That's an issue to deal with. So, uh, and then the, the child dropping moment was Pete just talked about the ratings. They don't lie. They are what they are for whatever reason or what they are. And that was a great accomplishment. Has that been broken? That record? I can't imagine. I mean, that was. And it was against the Stooges, you know, against your old buddy, Pat Patterson and Gerald Briscoe, just quite a spectacle. Get the entire conversation over with Pete Gass at adfreeshows.com where Pete talks about his real life friendship with Shane growing up around the McMahon family and his unbelievable transition from being just a wrestling fan to becoming a WWE superstar and somehow along the way, gaining the respect of some, some veterans that maybe you wouldn't expect. Catch the entire conversation, which I absolutely loved at adfreeshows.com right now, where you can also enjoy more than a hundred thousand hours of bonus content, including exclusive series. You can't get anywhere else with Lex Luger, the Godfather, David Crockett, Mike Chioda, Nick Patrick, Tully Blanchard. And now we're learning Lucha with Sam Adonis. You get all of this in addition to bonus content from all of my podcast co-hosts and all the old Starcast stage shows, every single one of them. More than a hundred thousand hours of bonus content plus interactive stuff. And JR, we've even got Top Guy Weekend on deck coming up in just a couple of weeks. It's going to be in Chicago right before AEW All Out. I think uh, you and I are slotted to watch some old bad wrestling promos and give our two cents. <laughs> I can't wait to see you eat up some old bad promos. That's going to be fun. And there were a lot of them to pick from. Yes, there were. Because there's one, it's, I, I'm a big proponent of guys going out and, and ad libbing, getting their message across in the, in a unique way and, and all that. I really am, but boy, some of them sucked. Some, some of the guys took for granted the opportunity to be on television and express themselves and they phoned it in and you could tell which ones were, were the shits. Uh, it, it smelled and it looked like shit. Guess what? It was shit. And uh, so we had some fun with that, Conrad. Anytime I can work with you, I enjoy it. And we're going to have a good time. I know what you like, too. So right before you go on stage or right after you come off, we're going to have some protein there with a knife and a fork like you like it. Uh, it. It's the only time where we have a convention, if you will, a little miniature convention, where tickets aren't on sale. You've got to be a part of our adfreeshows.com crew. All the details are available there now at adfreeshows.com. But without further ado, let's jump right into it. We're going to get in our Wayback Machine and talk about 20 years ago. This is 2004. So Brock Lesnar, who's left the company just a few months earlier around WrestleMania 20 time, he is at an NFL training camp for the Minnesota Vikings. I know you're a big football guy. Yeah. Uh, were you keeping tabs on what was happening with uh, the Beast Incarnate and the the mini camp with the Minnesota Vikings? Absolutely. Uh, he Brock was searching for something. Something was missing, and it was right under his nose. That was the pro wrestling business, and I think that statement bears itself out over the course of time. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah. Cause here's the thing. I knew pretty much he'd be back because he wasn't going to find anything that allowed him the flexibility and the freedom of the fun, hanging with the boys, being athletic, all that stuff. So, uh, I, I just felt like he was going to be back at some point in time and was such a premium talent as he was, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, you, you just don't lose track of those guys. Because they don't, they only made one Lesnar. So if he's going to get back in the hunt, I want to be at the front of the line to tag him back in. And that's how it worked out actually. So, uh, uh, yeah, Lesnar was a, it was a phenomenon. 
it could still be a phenomenon that they, they, but he spent so much money that he doesn't have the need for the cash right now. Apparently I would shocked if he did, he owns a bunch of land in Canada. You know, he's a farm boy. He can't take the farm out of the boy. So he was, uh, you, you can always got to keep track of those dudes, but you never know when their name's going to pop up or the old man's going to say, what about Lesnar? What's he doing? And you need to know. So, uh, I, I, uh, I'm glad that we had it run with him, but, uh, I didn't lose, I didn't lose track and I followed his football stuff, Viking stuff. Hey, he, he did real well in their camp. I, I don't, I don't know how, how the old wise still goes, what you've heard, but I think he was one of the last guys cut, like maybe the last guy or one of the top two or three. He made it right to the very end with a high school football background, not playing college football. That, that sticks to his, uh, uh, athleticism. And he had that, that nasty ass physical demeanor that was, wasn't an act. It was real. So, uh, yeah, Lesnar was, you never lose touch with a special talent, Conrad, never. Let's talk about Jeff Hardy, another special talent that uh, maybe some of us didn't expect here. He's going to wind up signing with TNA here in July of 2004. We know that, you know, he's just a few years removed from your famous call with him against the undertaker in that ladder match on Monday night, raw, make yourself famous kid. And boy, he was uh, over like Grover here in 2004. Oh, yeah. So a lot of people didn't expect there to ever be an opportunity where he was no longer with the WWE. We see though, he winds up in TNA. What can you tell us about that moment in time here? Well, I was sad to lose Jeff, uh, cause I first of all, personally liked him still do. Uh, but he got over and those opportunities to get over and maximize those minutes. I don't come along all the time. They're not guaranteed. So, uh, uh, but I, I figured he, he's another one that left the, left the home nest and, but I knew he'd be back. Cause the money was so different, you know, and I'll do respect to TNA, uh, uh, Dixie did the best she could with those guys, but that was a big, big overhead. That was a big overhead item. How long can you maintain that? And, uh, so I, 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 I liked, uh, him going out there and seeing what it was like, like he was in the Indies. Uh, but I knew he'd be back. Money's going to speak to, it's going to trump everything. Connie, you know that we should also talk about the, uh, the build for this pay-per-view because this is very much the Chris Benoit era. Of course, we're on the heels of WrestleMania 20 and they're going to do something that we didn't see very often. July 26th on a live episode of Monday night raw from Pittsburgh. We do a 60 minute Ironman match with Chris Benoit and triple H and just like the prior year where we tried this same sort of thing with Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar, it just flops in the ratings about, you know, a few minutes into the match, maybe 10 minutes into the hour long match fans tune out in droves. And then they come back in, in those last 10 to 15 minutes, I understand that you know, I've been critical of the Iron Man stipulation and saying that as a fan, I feel like I don't have to watch until the last few minutes. If I, if I'm just tuning in for the stories and the matches are sort of the background and, and, and the culmination, the blow off the finish, if you will, well, I've seen enough wrestling to know, Hey, I just need to watch the last 10 minutes and I'm good because it's going to keep you, keep you where the score is. And then you're going to know who won. And I've sort of compared it to like NBA basketball. Like if you see the last five minutes, you, you kind of got it. Yeah. Um, I take a lot of criticism online for that, but the masses clearly agree with me. Hey, I just want to see the end because they tune out, but yet the WWE goes back to it just a year later. So if we tried it with angle and Lesnar in 03, and we saw what the results results were, we watched the first 10 and maybe the last 10, we missed the middle 40. We tried again the next year, the exact same result. Were you surprised that Vince, so fresh off of the success of the Attitude Era, where it was mostly crash TV, was showing yeah. a 60 minute Iron Man match on free television? Yeah, it was quite the departure. And yeah. uh, uh, it wasn't the norm. 
So you really don't know how it's going to react or how it's going to respond or what the results could be. But I was a little, I was a little surprised it didn't do better than it did. Because I, I love that match. I think Triple H and, and Benoit are two great technicians. And for Benoit, who's especially hungry, and then Triple H wanting to hold on to his spot, uh, all the elements were there to have a, a great performance. And I don't think their performance was bad at all. I just think that uh, an hour match is test is, tests anybody's uh, will, willingness to stay invested that long in front of their television. We, uh, we should talk about Bruno San Martino here. He's actually at this uh, episode of Monday Night Raw in Pittsburgh. And I guess there is a, uh, a documentary being done independently of WWE, and they wanted to get footage of him at a wrestling show. So Bruno winds up attending the show, and this is a, a big deal because to say he was estranged from the WWE and Vince McMahon at this point is probably an understatement. Did you have any conversations with Bruno when you were quote unquote office at WWE? Yeah, all the time, all the time. Uh, hey, we'll put that picture back up of uh, Bruno. Look at those ears. Look closely to those ears. That's a lot of travel, a lot of miles, a lot of physicality. Uh, he was just a, Bruno was one of the finest human beings I ever met. Period. Just a, a wonderful guy. And I think that the reason for that was, uh, my late wife, Chan grew up in the same neighborhood. So she knew Mr. San Martino very well. Uh, and you know, over the years, I got to know his, his son, Daryl. Uh, but, but I, Bruno, I kind of took Bruno. I didn't say I wanted to, I don't want to say I took him under my wing, but I've made sure that if he needed anything, I was his source come to me, you know, he. He was just, uh, he was just a, a amazing human being. And I had had an introduction to, and what helped me with Bruno was cowboy cowboy bill Watts. Cause they had a, a tag team together back in the day in the sixties and, and WWF, uh, and then they had a, they shot their big angle that was hugely successful. Because people believe that Cowboy being so damn big and strong had the best chance as anybody had had in a long time to actually beat Bruno. People didn't want to see him lose, but they wanted to make sure they wanted to see if he did lose. And it was believable if that happened. So uh, I had a great introduction to Bruno before I ever met him. I had great respect for him because I believed in what Cowboy said. But they were a great team. I, I can't remember Bill explained this to me one time. The for, there was a formula. Every every booker has a formula of some sort. And you know, the, the goal is to get in, in that territory to get one main event in the garden, in Madison Square Garden. I think they got three. And that was at that in that era was unheard of. So uh it was just uh had to be a great time for fans back in that era, without question. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the developmental concept at the time. Uh, it's written in the Observer that Vince McMahon came last week to OVW to look over the talent and gave a speech and talked about signing more guys up for developmental and opening up more developmental territories. This didn't happen very often, where we would see Vince actually go to the developmental territories. Was that at your urging? Or, I mean, is this something where you're like, hey, show and face with the troops would really go a long way on this one, boss? Or why would Vince make a trip to OVW? It seems out of character for him. It was out of character for him, but he knew the value that I, I had a value. and I had a place of value on developing uh, the, the, the developmental system. Uh, now they got a great developmental system in WWE. It's called NXT. And, uh, they do a great job uh, with that. They're on TV show and uh, on USA, and I, I, I see where they're going to. Some of their, some of their products are moving to. Oh, they're moving to USA. Uh, SmackDown's moving to USA, I think. So anyway, uh, whatever, we'll find it. If you want to watch it, you'll find it. 
so uh, yeah, I, I it was it was a the future of it was a bloodline. It was no pun intended, but it was the future of our business was developing new talent. I said it here endlessly. Wrestling fans love new. They love to be surprised, and they love uh, they love believable new. Don't try to force somebody down my throat because that's not going to get it done. It's got to be more organic. And uh, so I, it was important for us. And I would suggest, I don't know the, the exact routing of it, but I would suggest to you that uh, it, he was going to be in the area. You know, maybe we're running Louisville or Lexington or something like that. But uh, I, don't, I don't know that he would make a special trip with no other agenda but this uh, on his docket. So, uh, I, I it, but it was very helpful. It gave a lot of the guys what, what you always want to try to stimulate, and that is hope. It gave a lot of guys hope that the boss cares about what we're doing down here. We're not forgotten. And uh, that worked out real well. I think uh, Vince was impressed by that one. You know, we had that one all-star cast with Batista, Cena, uh, Lesnar, Orton, Shelton Benjamin. Uh, among others, that was a class, you know, uh, like Oklahoma and Alabama and other major institutions. Everything's based on recruiting and signing top players, and and we had a we had a locker room full of them. It wasn't all pre pre planned, but some of the guys just developed really well. There was a report that also came out that says regarding company developmental expansion per last week, as this points to be the first new territorial expansion, what would likely be the Northeast based out of the tracks building in Stanford that they've leased where the wrestlers trained for the first two seasons of tough enough Tampa and Atlanta have been discussed as noted, but neither is official. And if it does happen, it would likely be months to a year away. Although there are plans to expand. I guess my big question is why wasn't there ever a developmental territory in the Northeast? Is it just based on the cost of living and what you were, the smaller pay you were going to pay these guys in camp? Like it seems like it would be very convenient to do this in your own backyard, quote unquote, from the office. Yeah. Well, money was one issue, uh, budgeting. Uh, we, we wanted to grow, to grow it. We know we were, I think Memphis was a, a, a landing spot. Louisville was the landing spot. Uh, Les Thatcher's group in Cincinnati was the landing spot. So we we had the plan, but it's going to take a while to get it all executed. You know, you you, you can build a team, but you got to have a team of players, and uh, and we didn't have a huge budget to pay these dudes. So it was uh it was a uh, interesting an ongoing, interesting development. We had to do it. So I told Vince, we, it's, I don't think it's an issue of having an option. Where are we going to get new talent? And where are they, they going to come from? It's not a casting agent that does it. So we've got to figure out how we're going to do that. So uh, it, it was imperative. It wasn't like, well, we should. No, we have to. We have to develop this area and this project. We, uh, we've got to give some props to somebody who's developed something pretty awesome, especially right now. If you're a guy like Jr. and you're having to be strategic in the way you pack, I'm talking about <laughs> how you can simplify travel with Mando's new four in one acidified cleansing bar. How about this? It's a five ounce bar that does the work of a shampoo, a face wash, a body wash and deodorant. And you can use it to create a rich shaving lather. So technically it's five in one. It's also clinically proven to control odor for 24 hours. Mando's four in one acidified cleansing bar is formulated with a gentle alpha hydroxy acid that stops odor at the source. You see, regular soap can't do that because the pH is too high. Now, uh, I don't know how many stars Dave Meltzer's given this, but hey, this <laughs> makes sense. We're killing stink at the source. This simplifies your hygiene routine, and it's really just about the only thing you need to pack. Other than if you're like me or Jim, maybe a CPAP machine. You can also yeah. get it in three quality, uh, cologne quality scents. Mount Fuji is fresh and woodsy. Bourbon leather is sweet and sophisticated. And how about Pro Sport? 
It's clean and citrusy. And I'm a big fan of the Mount Fuji. Uh, I think my wife actually prefers the Mount Fuji. I like the way Pro Sport feels. I've used these products. I really believe in Mando. And it's because I started with their whole body deodorant. It's seriously safe to use anywhere on your body. And I mean anywhere. Your Did pits. you use it on your balls, Conrad? Yeah, I used it on my asshole too, JR. You can actually <laughs> use deodorant on your balls, your asshole, your grundle, your boots, your gooch, your belly buttons, your butt cracks, your stinky crevices, your stomach folds, your feet. It's good to use everywhere. And it's safe to use everywhere because it's aluminum free. It's baking soda free. It's cruelty free. It's dye free. And they want you to be stink free. It's also vegan and American made. It's powerful enough to use anywhere on your body and kill that stank, but gentle enough to use anywhere on your body. And it's clinically proven to control odor better than just a shower with soap alone. We've got a brand new offer here too. New customers can get $5 off Mando's best-selling starter pack when they use our code JR at shopmando.com. That's S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. One more time, Mando starter pack, perfect for new customers. You get a solid stick deodorant. You get the cream tube deodorant. You get two free products of your choice, like mini body wash and deodorant wipes. Plus you get free shipping. And we've got that discount code to get you hooked up on our favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code that equates to like 40% off your starter pack. Just use our code JR at shopmando.com. That's S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. Man, all in one. They made it easy for us, Jim. Light packing. I love that. I used that this morning. How about that? It, 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 Amanda. I was using that product, Conrad, before they became an advertiser. All right. I love that. Yeah, it works. And the, you know, I'm a big, I want things to work that I buy. I'm sure everybody said, well, of course you do. But I stumbled on to Mando. I didn't, it wasn't a predetermined destination because they were, they were thinking about being a sponsor, et cetera, et cetera. It, the product just works. And hellfire, man, there's no reason in today's society to stink. There's no reason at all. So uh, I'll be this, I'll smell the best on that Delta flight going to Heathrow as anybody on the flight, thanks to Mando. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Shopmando.com, hit our promo code JR, save yourself $5 off the starter pack. Hey, let's talk about SummerSlam. What a crazy show this was. It went down August 15th at the Air Canada Center in Toronto. And of course, the big story is supposed to be Randy Orton winning the world title from Chris Benoit, becoming, I believe, to be the youngest champion at the time. But uh, instead, the story for a lot of people is this crowd. First of all, it's a complete sellout. It's announced as being 17,640 fans. It sold out weeks in advance. It's a $1.3 million gate in Canadian, so roughly a million dollars here in the United States. But we haven't had a big, rowdy, raucous crowd like this since WrestleMania. And maybe it's written in the Observer that the crowd wasn't really responding the way the company had expected. And it feels like you ran into that a few times in Canada where we're presenting something as this is the heel and this is the baby face and he's your hero. Let's go cheer him. Rah, rah, rah. But sometimes those fans in Canada, boy, they have their favorites and well, they didn't always go the way WWE would expect. Do you remember Vince or anyone on the writing team or maybe even the performers being frustrated with the reactions they got? Yes, we're glad they showed up, but that's not what we expected. I think the uh, biggest uh, takeaway from that Conrad is what you just said. Uh, they showed up. Yes. They showed up in droves, uh, one point, what would you say it was $1.3 million house. That's right. That's, that's a good accomplishment. 20 I, years I, ago, I, by the way. Yeah. I can't, I can't justify or figure out or analyze any, any logic in being displeased with a $1.3 million gate. Uh, I always enjoyed working in Canada because the audience was unpredictable, uh, and like you said, things that you thought might be, uh, oh, I don't know, predictable, weren't. So uh, it was. Uh, it, I, I I always enjoyed that. They were un, they were un, uninhibited, and I love that because it keeps you on your toes. It's kind of like the WrestleMania 18 Rock Hogan match. 
you know, that, that, that completely flipped the script. Hogan was supposed to be the heel. Didn't work out that way by, by a long shot. So all Lawler and I just switched jerseys and became a Hogan guy person. And, and I just told the story as we saw it. And, uh, and so instead, I think a lot of young announcers would probably have just worked their ass off to, uh, oh hell, I don't know, uh, to, you know, to, 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 to go to the, go to the company line rocks, the baby face. we got to make him a baby face. Well, if they're not buying it, there's no reason to make him a baby face. Go with what you're what you're hearing and what you're seeing. It makes it so much more, so much easier. And I thought Lawler and I did a nice job on that on that match, but it just points out an illustration of how the how all that could work out if you just follow the audience. There's nothing more important than communicating with your audience, whether it be on television or pay per view or or in the in the arena for that matter. So uh, I. Uh, uh, I, I, I always enjoyed the Canadian audience. They were, they're, they're a passionate, some of the most passionate moments in the attitude era in the very early part of it, uh, was, uh, on, on Monday night raw on, uh, like, for example, like in Halifax, you know, I'd never been to Halifax before. I remember we all flew in on, on Saturday, which was very unusual for a Monday night raw. Uh, and that was the show that, uh, do you remember when Brett pulled or Vince pulled the soccer jersey over B- Brett's head? Absolutely. That was pretty, that was pretty dramatic. And it wasn't, it wasn't rehearsed or advertised because I was around those guys all day. They felt it and they did it and it worked. Let's talk about the, uh, the show we've got, um, a, a dark match with Rob Van Dam pinning Rene Dupree. This is not really a dark match because it's on Sunday night heat. Rob Van Dam though, you know, we know a year from now is going to be at the top of the mountain here. He's on a heat match just a year prior. And I know that sometimes, you know, fans get caught up on positioning and things like that, but this is a great reminder that not everybody can be in the main event every week. Like just a year later, Man, he's at the top of every card, the world champ, the ECW champ. And well, that's not exactly the case just yet here in 2004. Do you think it was just timing for creative or was the company still warming up to Rob in some respect? Maybe a little bit of both, but I think that it was just a fact that his time had not come. You know, if we look back at it with a somewhat, uh, uh, you know, glazed eyes. We could say that, uh, well, look how good he did. You guys didn't push the button quick enough. You never know when to push the button. Uh, the great thing for Rob was through his hard work and his uniqueness, uh, it worked, it worked out really well. He had a great run there and made a lot of money at WC at WWE. Uh, so, uh, that was a good move for us to get him signed and, and there, but you know, he had, he had a little baggage, you know, you never know what he said. She said. He's going to smoke dope every day, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the least of my worries, to be honest with you, Conrad, and this is probably going to be taken a, a, in a variety of ways. Uh, there's a lot worse things that a talent can do than smoke pot. Yeah. Really is. I mean, let's, let's just get down to brass tacks. You know, one of the hot contested issues in politics here where I am now in Jacksonville Beach is uh, uh, there's a uh, an amendment on to, to make, uh, to address marijuana in Florida. And, uh, it's pretty significant. You know, their, their advocate campaign says, well, when you buy marijuana off the street, you don't know what all's in it. And how's it been cut? How's it been laced? Is it laced with anything or, or what? Uh, but that's kind of where we are here with this particular referendum is it's, uh, I'm not endorsing it or not. I'm not in politics, but point being is that it's a, it's a, it's going to win. And uh, all the people that they have there, that they're using as spokespersons, uh, are, are clean, good looking businessmen and women. 
because they want, if you're going to have marijuana, let's make it safe and let's maximize its uh, revenue. You know, I got a, we got a, a little dispensary in, in Tulsa, uh, JR's Black Hat Farms. And, and uh, I just got a little update from my daughter last night. We've been, we've uh, perfected a small, like maybe yay big, uh, uh, you know, uh, vape pen. And there's, there's, it's small, it's smaller than a lighter, smaller than, it's just, uh, easy to, uh, I don't want to say hide, but it's, it's very indiscreet, very discreet. And, uh, so hopefully Oklahoma's going to catch up with everybody else and, and legalize it. And, uh, that would be nice for me, uh, quite frankly, because it's a, it's a business investment. So it works out pretty good. Anyway, uh, we're going down another rabbit hole. Sorry. Let's talk about the pay-per-view. We got the Dudleys teaming with Spike Dudley to take on Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, and Paul London. It gets two and three-quarter stars. You got a lot of talent in there. I mean, the yep. Dudleys are, are bona fide stars in WWE by this point. But the other side, man, what a group. Billy Kidman, Rey Mysterio, and Paul London. We've spent a lot of time on this show talking about Rey Mysterio. I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about Paul London I really did feel like after seeing his work on the independence that, man, this guy was going to be the next big thing. And certainly he enjoyed some success as a tag team with Brian Kendrick in WWE. Is he another example of, uh, I don't know, uh, timing is everything. I feel like if Paul London was coming on the scene right now, he would be received totally different than he was 20 years ago. Probably. Yeah, probably. He's a talented kid, a uh, talented kid, you know, high spots, offense, et cetera. Uh, that was kind of his calling card, but yeah, he was, uh, he never realized his total potential. Uh, I don't know what the reason for that is. Normally you can generalize the reason being, he just did not connect with the audience to the level that they're going to make an emotional investment in his TV persona. Uh, but he was, uh, uh he, he didn't find, uh, the magic space. If you will, he just, uh, but everything he did in the ring was solid. Maybe he did too much. Hell, I don't know. You can go back and analyze it to death, but, uh, I'm with you. He, he had more potential than, uh, we got out of him. Next up is something that I think all of us remember Kane and Matt Hardy, where this is a till death do us part match. Lita will marry the winner. Boy, this is some soap opera gaga for sure. We go six minutes and eight seconds. Kane wins, and now he gets to marry Lita. And it's written here in the Observer as a reminder that Matt Hardy had gone on his website and posted that he needed knee surgery and that this would be his last match. And I guess internally, folks in the WWE camp were upset, like, hey, man, you just gave away the result of the match here when you reveal that you need knee surgery. This is a new era for professional wrestling where, you know, wrestlers are able to communicate with their fans online. And perhaps Matt Hardy was one of the first to do that with his yeah. website and his YouTube and things like that. Um, do you remember this being a, an issue or some, a teachable moment for the rest of the roster? If that makes sense. Well, it was, certainly was a teachable moment because they learned what to do and what not to do. Yeah. But and Matt, uh, shit to bed on that decision on that deal. And I think the world of the Hardys, God almighty, I hired them. And their little homemade outfits that they made on their late mama's sewing machine. Uh, you know, I've told that story on television many times. Uh, so yeah, I, I, it just made common sense. Just, you know, he's trying to get a scoop, trying to get hits or, or, you know, whatever, whatever you call his damn thing. But he was, uh, there was the wrong place, the wrong time to get, provide that information. It may have been good for a few minutes on his website. But all in all, it was a mistake to reveal that info. This didn't you think about it. This didn't make any sense. You're, like you said, Conrad, where he's revealing the finish of the match. What, what was the, uh, well, I mean, what did you think of that creative Matt and Kane winner gets to marry Lita? I mean, this is a little silly, no? Yeah, no. Yes, it is a little silly. Uh, 
the more I could see Lita, the better off I liked it personally as a red blooded American man. Uh, but, uh, it was soap opera at its best in that respect. If he liked it, if you like soap opera and you like sensationalism, then you probably accepted the uh, angle and the storyline more than others. If you're looking for violence and, and all this stuff, uh, may not have been your cup of tea, but she, you know, we're just trying to have some, find something that people c- could connect to. And, uh, I don't know what the, how the ratings in this thing did, but, uh, it got a lot of TV time. A lot and, of TV uh, time. And, and people were disappointed yeah. with the match saying that they didn't feel like given how much TV time had been dedicated to it, that the match maybe didn't line up with the heat or the story. It only gets a star and a quarter in the observer, but wow, I don't think those fans were ever going to be really happy with a storyline like this. I mean, it just feels, I don't know, like something out of the eighties, maybe. I don't know one thing. Uh, if I saw what the results of the ratings were or anything else, I would have uh, got my racer out and we have not, we would have finished that storyline quickly. Yeah. That's what you do. That's why the t- the TV ratings uh, tell v- a variety of stories that uh, we could pay, we should pay attention to because I think it directly affects the booking. Uh, if the bookings, it's going to tell you right there. there. People are not interested in this deal. Uh, or you mentioned something earlier about uh, how much audience uh, or how much audience we lost or something. Well, that tells you that they're not interested in seeing it in its current form. Right. Doesn't mean you got to shit on it and get rid of it, or does it? Uh, you got to make that's a judgment decision. So uh, I, I I didn't hate it because all those guys are my hires. And I wanted to see them do well and make all the money that they could. And, uh, I thought the upside for Lita was uh, unlimited. And I think that was been proven true. Uh, she was, she had it, she connected for whatever reason, uh, with her audience and the TV audience Her her persona in the ring was liked and, uh, it kept, kept the audience tuned in. Because she was such a unique female wrestler. And that might get me in trouble. If you, can you say female anymore? I don't even know what, what's, what's uh, kosher. Yeah, you can say female. Female's okay. All right. I, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so. <laughs> hey, let's talk so about I, John Cena. You know what I'm saying? He's going to be wrestling Booker T here in the first of their best of five series for the U.S. title. I think longtime wrestling fans remember the best of seven series with Nikita and Magnum TA with JCP. And then right. we tried it again with the TV title, I believe, with Booker T and Chris Benoit and WCW. And now it's John Cena's turn. And they only go six minutes and 25 seconds. Here's what Meltzer had to say Cena looked bad on offense, even in a short match. You can really see the difference in quality of a worker that Booker is compared with Benoit or Angle, who got great matches out of Cena. Most of this match was watching Cole miss call kicks and task correcting him. Lots of timing issues at the end. And Cena used the FU out of nowhere. Three quarters of a star. Listen, this is before John Cena is John Cena, but we're making him. We're trying to create him here. It's a process. Uh, yes. It's a process. It's going to take some time. And you just hope that it gets over. Because we're investing the time. And the create creative creative on him. Uh, the one thing we all you always knew about John, you could rely on him. He's going to going to come to work. He's going to do his thing, and he was just a a valuable such a valuable asset in the locker room. Notwithstanding all the Make a Wish uh, projects that he was working with and working on, he made a lot of kids that were terminally ill happy. And, uh, that's hard to put a value on that. We should spend a little bit of time talking about the next match. It's edge and Chris Jericho and Batista. It's a three-way match, a triple threat match for the intercontinental championship. At this point, you know, Batista is certainly destined for stardom. He's going to be a world champion at this point. Jericho already has been, and we're still trying to get there for edge. We know he's on deck. You've got so many major talent on the cusp of being bigger stars, whether it's Rob Van Dam or it's John Cena 
or here it's Edge and Batista, but you've got two faces and one heel. That's got to be, I mean, triple threats as a whole feel like they, they're probably more challenging than a regular match as, as the guy who's trying to put lyrics to the music their performers are making. Do you find that more challenging, a triple threat versus mono y mono? A, a little bit. It, it all depends on how the talent's working. If the talent's buying into the concept that uh, it's every man for himself and they act accordingly to that concept, uh, it's not hard at all. Uh, you know, I looked at that picture a while ago of that Bull put up there of uh, those three guys thinking that, well, Alpha trained Batista, uh, Stu Hart trained. Jericho, Tom Pritchard, Dory Jr. trained Edge. They all had good mentors. That that was important, and uh, they are already at that time. They had great training, great coaching, mentorship, so forth. So uh, that was a unique match. I little did any of us know how big all those guys were going to become, and they all became huge. They all became world champions. Shout out to Ron Hutchinson for uh, getting Edge going too. Yeah, oh yeah, Ron. Ron did a hell of a job. Ron probably was at the very beginning of that line. Yeah, that helped promote uh, uh, Edge because he was a, a, a Toronto guy. Yeah, and so forth. So uh, yeah, Ron did a great job. I, that's my bad. I missed. I missed that one, but uh, but I didn't. I didn't miss his work. He did a great job. He was a good coach and a good fundamental teacher. And a good guy, you know, that means something to my world. It means something to my world. I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to compare him to Buzz Sawyer as a coach because Buzz is a crazy human being that, uh, you know, he's passed away obviously, but I just, you got to have a good base. You got to have guys that have character and integrity. And my God, you look at the edge, for example. We had Ron Hutchinson there to help. Uh, you had Dory Jr. Dory Funk Jr. Pretty good. And Tom Pritchard, who was very un- underra- underrated in my view. One of the best coaches in the business still is. So uh, it was just a, it, the, the pieces started coming together in a nice, comfortable package. And now the next thing is this is going to be up to the talent to take it to the next step, take it to the next level, improve your game, uh, take, take away all the little nuances that you're doing that may not be, uh, totally advantageous. Were you surprised that this crowd in Toronto turned on edge in this match? I mean, he's one of their own. He's supposed to be, you know, baby face and a big star here. And I, I, I don't know. It's weird that you know, the fans turn on him and as a result, he's going with it. So he starts making sort of heel as face heelish facials, but this was written about a lot in the newsletter that, you know, I think everybody expected edge to be like the hometown hero, but that is not the welcome he got. No, but he worked through it. Yes. he That's did. the beautiful part about him and, and his coaching and his teaching. Uh, he, he steered the course and, uh, you know, th- you sell what the audience is buying. It's that simple. So uh, I don't think he got thrown out of his off his game uh, too drastically. Uh, I don't recall that match being a bad match at all. D- did you prefer Edge's work as a heel or a babyface? Heel. Yeah, I do too. Heel. Because uh, he, he was beatable. He was a wrestling heel. Uh, he had great facial expressions, as you alluded to moments ago. Uh, just... Uh, a uh, real pro and I'm, I'm happy he's an AEW now. And, uh, because he gets a chance to expand his own creativity. You know, Tony Khan is uh, supportive of the talents with their idea, especially the veterans. You know, I, I don't know who's going to do what agents going to lay out the match between swerve and Brian Danielson, but I can guarantee you it'll be a collective effort and you got Danielson sitting at the head of the table neck on that particular creative thing. Not that Swerve doesn't do it or can't do it. He does, but, uh, that'll, when you got guys to that level, you know, I, I believe that Swerve is 
maybe the most underrated world champion in the entire business right now. I might be overstating that. I don't know. I don't think we'll so. Find, we'll find out Sunday. Well, something we did find out in our fifth match here, it's Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero. It's a rematch from WrestleMania 20, and boy, is it a big one. They go 13 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, Luther Reigns is on the outside. He had a cup of coffee with the company, and he actually interfered only one time. Um, but they're playing off of the, the finish with the boot slipping off at WrestleMania 20. Ultimately, Angle gets the win, three and three-quarter stars. And it's written in the observer later on that Kurt convinced Eddie that losing would actually be better for him. You know, this is, uh, what a difference a year makes, you know, from being at the top of the mountain and being the world champ to now he's in this spot. And I know that you know, we've heard a little bit from, from Bruce about the pressure that, that Eddie was under as the world champ and how much it affected him and how he wore the stress of being the top guy when things were maybe on a downward trend. Do you think Eddie was still under some sort of pressure or stress or what was he like here in the summer of Oh four? He very, he internalized a lot. Conrad, Eddie did. He overthought things sometimes. Uh, I spent many, many hours with Eddie at, at TVs and things going over stuff, not how to apply headlock. Had nothing to do with the mechanics of a wrestling match. It just had to do with his attitude and don't be expecting too much. Uh, be, don't be, don't be afraid to exhale occasionally. And, uh, uh, but that they had a, I thought that that, that was one of the better matches on the entire show. Uh, and while, and if it hadn't have been, we'd all been shocked because you talked about two of the great workers in, in, in that era of all time. Next up, something a little crazy. Triple H is going to wrestle Eugene at SummerSlam, and they go 14 minutes and six seconds. And if you're one, if you want a reminder, the Dudley six man went eight minutes. Kane and Matt Hardy, where the winner gets to marry Lita, went six minutes. John Cena and Booker T for the U.S. title went six minutes. A three-way with Edge, Jericho, and Chris Jericho went eight minutes, and Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero went 13. So, of course, we're going to get Eugene and Triple H 14 minutes. Triple H had already developed a reputation for having the longest matches on the show, but I think everybody agreed at this point, except maybe WWE. As a fan, man, Eugene was best in small doses. That character... Got unanimously booed here in Toronto, which is happening more and more. And I don't think that they expected that. Like, I don't think this is a boo. Like we don't like Eugene. I think it's a boo of, Hey, we don't want to see this character. We don't, we don't like this story. And there is a big pop in the match where Eugene's going to flip off triple H and then hit a stunner that gets a huge pop. But of course it reminds everybody of stone cold. And then later we see him do the Hulk up and the leg drop and the whole thing. But in the end, Triple H gets the win. But this feels like a misuse of both Eugene and Triple H at a big pay-per-view. What say you? Well, Eugene was an attraction player. He was a guy that you see occasionally uh, in short doses. Uh, and that's a, you hit her on the head. You nail on the head there, Conrad. The the less use of him is uh uh, keeps him more effective, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like the boys all, you know, well, if, if I can get if the difference in me working 10 minutes and working 13 minutes is a difference maker. It's more often or not. It's really not. If you're trying to stretch, uh, you shouldn't have to do too much stretching in a pay-per-view, quite frankly, uh, a lot of action, succinctness, uh, it, it just, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I did that match didn't kill me. We told a long story about it. It had, had, it had legs, uh, were the legs running or walking? I guess that's another question one could ask. Uh, but I didn't, it, I didn't, I didn't hate that match. And I know that the traditionalists are not going to like it because of the presence of Eugene, he was a gimmick. He was a gimmick. He was an attraction guy. He's a frigging gimmick. And I, uh, 
I had a lot of time for him. You know, he was one of the stalwarts down in OVW, Nick Dennis Moore, and uh, uh, he paid his dues. Very solid fundamentally, but the, the, the gimmick just never resonated with the masses. Let's talk uh, a little bit about something that does resonate with the masses. Our next sponsor needs no introduction. You've seen the ads. You've heard us talk about it like a million times. And I bet there's still a big part of you, pun intended, that wants to try it. <laughs> I'm talking about Blue Chew. Come on now. This ain't your grandpa's blue pill. This is the one. It's the OG chewable tablet for better sex. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but at a fraction of the cost and in a chewable form. Now, y'all, the process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door. And how about this? It's all done online. That's the best part. It means there's no visits to the doctor's office. It means there's no awkward conversation. It means there's no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And you can take them anytime, day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Blue Chew wants you to have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Here's what they've told me. Blue Chew wants the entire country rock hard. That's the mission. They will not stop until every man is bricked up like a brick house, until every tent is pitched, until every rod is raised. Discover your options at bluechew.com. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code JR at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is JR, and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. By the way, have I told you what I'm helping people with in my real life? Yeah, I'm helping them save money over at SaveWithConrad.com. If you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Go get yourself a quick quote. All of a sudden, it feels like, hey, we got a little bit of help. Interest rates have improved, and people are realizing, hey, now's a chance to save some cash. And I'm talking to you. If you're still on the fence about buying a house, we can get you out of that apartment, tell your landlord to kiss your grits, and get you into a brand new house. You can do that with 5% down, with 3.5% down. And yes, there are still no money down options available in 2024. Savewithconrad.com is your first step. We're going to ask you, hey, where are you now and where would you like to be? And we're going to get you on a path to fit those short-term goals, but really meet the long-term goal that we all want. And that's to appreciate the American dream. The American dream isn't to give 29% of your gross monthly income every month until you die to some banker. No, you want to own that thing for real, your own piece of land for you and your family, your legacy. I always think about this when I'm going through like old photo binders and when I'm at my grandma's or my aunt's or my uncle's or my mom or dad or whatever, as we flip through those old family photo albums, I can't help but notice the backdrop in all of those photos. Well, that's our house, man. That's the stage for our family and, and our lives. And we want to help you get one for yourself at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And maybe, maybe you've already got a house, but it'd be nice if you could pay a little less. We're routinely finding a way to help our podcast listeners combine all of their debt. And I mean all of it. Credit cards, personal loans, even car payments. Get it into one low monthly payment. Not only is it a better interest rate, it's also a greater tax deduction, but maybe most importantly, a much cheaper payment. Routinely helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, even eight hundred bucks a month. But how much can you save? Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. And don't forget, we don't say no, we say not yet, but here's how at SaveWithConrad.com. You guys, the housing market's really good right now, too, for you folks out there that are thinking of making a change uh, in your overhead or, or your living conditions. Uh, now's not a bad time to make that move. Uh, I'm not a real estate expert, but I do read and I do listen, but I think right now it's not a bad time to explore that opportunity. Nowhere better to do it than savewithconrad.com. He's going to save you money. He's going to be honest. And it's like dealing with a friend, an educated friend. And boy, there's a lot of uneducated and unfriendly people in that world. Conrad Thompson is not one of them. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Jim. Check out our reviews online. You're going to see we've got more than a thousand five-star reviews. Customer service is what it's all about. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So there's no application fee. There's no credit report fee. 
we just want to talk, man. Hey, tell us where you are and tell us where you want to be, and we'll try to help you get a plan to get there. We want to be your advocate, your humble advocate at SaveWithConrad.com. Attaboy, Connie. Hey, look, at those cheeks, ladies. look at those cheeks, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. My God. How could you say no to that, right? Uh, JBL and The Undertaker are here next, and they're going to go 17 minutes and 37 seconds. Look at this tale of the tape. I used to like when you guys would do this. Six foot 10 versus six foot six, 305 pounds versus 297 pounds. The tombstone pile driver versus the clothesline from hell. But maybe my favorite, the undertaker's from death Valley and JBL's from New York city. Hey, uh, we're going to talk about the match, but I got to ask, I, I don't think a lot of people had it on their bingo card that they'd ever see JBL at a wrestling show other than a WWE show. But this past weekend, at Triple Mania in Mexico, John Layfield walked Nick Nemeth, the former Dolph Ziggler, down to the ring. What'd you make of this? JBL outside the tent in AAA in Mexico? Goodness gracious. Yeah, why not? I mean, really, why not? Uh, you know, John's still keeping his toe in the water. Uh, he's a WWE guy through and through, no matter where he might appear. I think since Triple H is running that company, uh, he's been a lot more, uh, a lot, a lot easier to work with than, than Vince was. This is no way in hell Vince would have endorsed, uh, JVL to, uh, be involved in another promotions, major event with the next talent, ex WWE star like Nick Nemeth. Nemeth. Uh, I remember when Jerry Briscoe got him recruited and, uh, he uh, never let us down. My God, the good matches this guy had. If anything, Nick didn't get the credit that he deserved for the consistent main event level work that he did. But uh, I was surprised to see that. I, I, but I'm happy for John. Uh, why not, man? Uh, enjoy. That's what he does. It's his living. And it's his, his passion. So I, uh, I, I was surprised to see that, Conrad, to be honest with you. Like you said, it's. It kind of came out of the blue and it just seems like sometimes that, uh, we live in a different world with uh triple a and so forth. They, they are, they're a unique company and, uh, they has, they do a nice job of strategically using outside talents. And there's a gift to that. This is the era where JBL has uh, really moved into his own. He's, we've created this JBL character. It's hard to believe that was 20 years ago. And now that we've got the belt off Eddie Guerrero, I know that the undertaker, uh, was, uh, was a big fan of the JBL character and the presentation, but I don't think the fans that night in Toronto were into it. It felt like they were paying almost no attention to the match, but we're going to see kind of a fun deal where in the post-match, because it is a DQ, Undertaker is going to beat John Layfield all the way back down to where he made the big entrance in the big white limo. And then the big move post-match is a choke slam through the roof of the limousine. When I say through it, I mean through it. They gimmicked it and down goes Layfield. So you're sending fans home with a DQ. The heel retains. But in the post-match, the babyface gets the big moment of choke slamming the heel. Yeah. What'd you think of that? They didn't have a problem with it. Are you saying that you have a problem that undertaker didn't win cleanly? Oh no, not at all. I just think I like the idea of the, the baby face getting his heat back. So to speak is a, is a phrase I think that's used in the business, but I like sending fans home happy. So if we really wanted to see JBL lose, well, um, he maybe retained the bat, retained the belt, but boy, he lost the battle when his ass got choke slammed through a dog on limo. Right? Yeah, that gave the people what they wanted. That's right. And that, at the end of the day, that's always should be a Booker, a creative person's goal: provide the fans with what they want to see, and uh, see JVL get, uh, uh, you know, butchered, slay, and, and cut up. Was kind of that was the deal. Undertaker has to look strong. He did. There was a big spot. Had to be a, a big spot, and there was. So, uh, how the tally ended up being who was going to get the one, two, three, and all that crap. Uh, 
I don't see it being a, a big issue. I, I think those guys had decent chemistry. They liked each other. They're Texas guys. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, uh, and, and it was interesting time. It was the developmental time for JBL. He was learning on the job. He's a smart guy, uh, understood the business. He was very motivated. Like many of the boys, he was extremely motivated by cash or the potential thereof of making more cash. And uh, Undertaker, of course, is the Undertaker. He's our Lou Gehrig. He's just, he's, uh, there's nobody any more special or unique than Mark Calloway at, at his portrayal of the Undertaker. Just, uh, it's, a, it's a match made in hell in a good way. Was it too soon, do you think, for the JBO character? I mean, I, I really love John Layfield in real life, and I know that some people online who've never met him have a, a predisposition about things they've read or they've heard. I would just encourage you, just meet the guy before you make a decision like that. Yeah. But, but, it, it, table, but he's a Texan, Conrad. You know that, right? Yeah, so he sucks. I get that. Uh, yeah. But let's just table all that for a minute. <laughs> he has been... An enhancement talent. I mean, he was an undercard guy and then a mid-card guy, and then he became a big part of the APA, but they were more of an attraction. Yes, they had title matches and all that, but he's kind of felt like he was a guy on the roster, but not necessarily a main event type guy. That's not the way he's been positioned. And now we create this new JBL character, and we're trying to get in there. So I could see how, on the one hand, hey, let's give him some credibility with a, a really established talent like the undertaker. But at the same time, I'm wondering, was that really playing to his strengths as an in ring performer? Should we have had a smaller in stature guy that he can bully around and he can be the bigger body and pick up some dominating wins before we get to the undertaker? Or I just felt like there was uh, a lot of stops and starts when we're first establishing JBL. Like I loved his stuff with Eddie Guerrero, but the stuff with undertaker Maybe it felt like it was too soon for me. Where do you land on that? I, I didn't think it was too soon. Uh, personally, it was, it's a part of the developmental concept of, of building a talent and adding credibility as you go along. And in order to do all those things, it's got to be done in a very judicious, deliberate way. And, uh, you know, we were still working on John's character. John was developing the JVO persona. And, uh, those guys, uh, I thought they had a, a solid match without question, but it's all in the process of trying to, and trying to continue to establish JBL as a name player. And, uh, I think we did that. I think we all combined did that. You know, John had a big hand in his own creative. He's a smart guy, as I said. And he knew what he could do and what he couldn't do, what his strengths were. He played to his strengths. And uh, like I said, the only negative I could think about John is his Texan. And he don't let you forget it either, by God. I want to ask you a little bit about the uh, a taped thing that happened here on the show. We're still going to talk about the main event, which is Randy Orton and Chris Benoit. And I actually want to talk about some policy changes right after the pay-per-view. Uh but going into this pay-per-view extravaganza called SummerSlam 2004, the big things, the biggest things pushed on television had been the Diva Search, Eugene, and this Lita wedding. And the Divas dodgeball thing airs on this show. It's a, as I understand it, a shoot competition. It's real dodgeball, as funny as that sounds. But it was pre-taped. And Meltzer would say the company's women under contract looked bad in every way possible. First, the WWE women were dressed up as athletes while the non-contract performers were wearing skimpy outfits, thus looking far more sexy. Second, no doubt the idea was to make the non-contract workers would be embarrassed by looking totally unathletic as opposed to the athletic looking WWE women. Well, they did look unathletic except for Michelle who was then dumped the next day, playing the role of this year's Bar Gun, still whipped from the contract women to where there were five of them left while all the WWE women were eliminated. And all I could think when it was over was, thank God they didn't try to have them play volleyball. Like, why would we do a, on, on a WWE show, on a predetermined, you know, we all know what pro wrestling is, why would you do a shoot dodgeball thing 
Like that feels weird. Well, Conrad is called sports entertainment. Okay. Uh, it was a, a, a large departure from, uh, Alita Trish match. Huge departure. Uh, but it was, it was a trend. That was what, that's what the uh, creative process was pushing. They were looking for ways to get people to tune in. And if you stop and think about it, you know, uh, our target audience are, are male. Yeah. In that era, you got some very attractive ladies doing at, you know, a, a somewhat athletic things and they look good doing it. The, the thing about something like that is that it needs to be, uh, succinct cut to the chase. Let's go. And, uh, but that, that's the only thing I can say. And I don't know if it justifies it or frankly, but I think that's the, the reason sports entertainment was what they were shooting for. And with all these beautiful women and playing a game that people are familiar with volleyball. Uh, I know some of the, some of the, uh, Olympics and, and volleyball were very, uh, intriguing because they were wearing next to nothing. Nobody's talked about that. The, the, the Olympic women were including, uh, uh, that little Shakari Richardson, sexy as hell. So I, I just think that's, uh, that's just the way of the world. And maybe we were a little bit ahead of time, but our audience of wrestling fans, not sports entertainment fans, but our audience of wrestling fans didn't buy it. Let's talk about our main event and we'll see how many people bought it. Uh, well, I guess we should talk about how many people bought it. The prior year at SummerSlam, which was uh, headlined by an Elimination Chamber match, did 465,000 buys. We're all the way down to 320,000 here. So, quite a situation. Or maybe the sports entertainment thing is not being bought. Yeah. It's just maybe that's just not the flavor of ice cream that people are buying at their local shop. And that's kind of how I look at it. If it had worked, it would have been the greatest idea in the world. It didn't work, but I can understand trying it because it should have appealed to the largest segment of the WWE audience at that time. Uh, and that was men still is. Let's talk about the main event here. I, I think this one doesn't get discussed enough for obvious reasons because of Chris Benoit, but we've got the big gold belt on the line and Chris Benoit is our champion. Of course, we're not too far removed from. That incredible performance at WrestleMania 20 and the follow-up at Backlash. But now here we are, SummerSlam, and we're challenging or we're allowing Randy Orton to be a challenger here. He was born April 1st, 1980. So when he wins, he's going to become the youngest world champion in WWE history. And when I say when he wins, because a lot of people didn't expect that that would be the case. Maybe they thought the fix was in when they realized Earl Hebner was the referee and there's lots of you screwed Brett chance, but in the end, none of that mattered. Uh, Orton's mouth gets busted open. Benoit's going to go for a cross face. Randy escapes and hits the RKO out of nowhere. And that gets the pin. And there is a huge pop for the three count. Fans are excited that they've seen a title change. Maybe they didn't expect that since we're in. And Canada. it was, it was new. It hadn't been done. So again, being new is important. Uh, and being fresh is important. And that's what th those are a couple of elements of many that, uh, those guys brought to the table. Randy's so young and, and, uh, like I said, people like new, they like new and, and, and we gave them new on that night. It's amazing to think back on this match, because I think if you go back and watch this, and I know some people say they can't watch Benoit matches and I understand, but. Randy Orton looks like he's an old pro at this point. He's still very new in his career, but the chemistry he has with Benoit here, he looks like a main event player. Jim, you've seen them all in your 50 years. As far as, as, far as just being a natural in-ring talent, where do you think Randy Orton ranks all time? Right there, right there at the top of the list, Connor. Kind of, sorry to interrupt you. Right there at the top of the list, uh, without question. He's a natural. Uh, it, 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 pro wrestling uh, it was in his DNA still is. He still goes out and has 
as good a match as anybody on the card uh, to this very day. He's talented as hell, and he's uh, brought his game forward with him uh, on uh, through all his title reigns, main events, and so forth. Uh, but people like knew he was a handsome young guy, uh, fresh. Oh, this whole act had not been replicated. In other words, he didn't have multiple ta- uh, multiple championship runs uh, before this night. So uh, I, it made all the sense in the world when you think about it logically. But uh, I think that's the whole thing. It proves my point to some degree. Wrestling fans like new, and they like believable new. And Orton, uh, as you said, was so skilled that uh, his believable new uh, sold tickets. How great was it, too, the very next night on Monday Night Raw, we see a turn. The rest of Evolution turns on Orton at the end of the night, and it is a classic moment. You see, if you're watching with us on YouTube, Batista has Randy Orton on his shoulders. Of course, Randy was crying the night before when Benoit jumped back in the ring and demanded that you be a man and shake my hand. He's the youngest world champion of all time, and of course, that wasn't Triple H's plan. So he starts with the thumbs up, then does the thumbs down. Randy Orton is now babyface, and Evolution is no more, at least with uh, Randy Orton involved. Now, it's written in the Observer that that wasn't a long-term planned out event. Allegedly, the original idea was to continue with a rematch for Benoit and Orton at Unforgiven, and we would have William Regal team with Eugene to take on Triple H and Ric Flair in a tag team affair. Shawn Michaels would be working against Kane. And then La Resistance would take on Rhino and Tajiri. Those were the matches slotted for Unforgiven. Seeing the reaction Eugene got at SummerSlam, all that's out the window, and now it's going to be Triple H and Randy Orton. And I got to say, I like that creative a lot better. Like, it's hard for me to imagine as much as I enjoyed the thumbs up, thumbs down thing for Randy Orton and and Triple H, that that wasn't the plan all along. Because, boy, it sure did fit, didn't it? Yeah, it fit great. It yeah. fit really good. You can you can make an argument that Triple H getting that title opportunity that quick against Randy might have been a little premature. You can make that argument. But uh, you, you always knew that when the bell rang, they were going to put on a classic. And at the end of the day, that's what, as a booker or administrator, that's what you're always looking for. Uh, somebody that's going to carry the load, provide a hell of a product, and, and those guys uh, did that. I mean, it's just I wish we could have had something in between and not going right to uh, Randy and uh, Triple H. Not that I didn't like the match. I just thought there, there's more uh, uh, more green grass that uh, we hadn't explored uh, with those guys. We got there quick, and I thought that was a mistake. Hey, this whole youngest champion – record that Randy Orton holds now, he's actually going to be replacing Brock Lesnar as that designated youngest champion. Of course, it happened for Brock two years prior at SummerSlam 02 when he beat The Rock. But there's a lot of fans online who think that maybe there was some sort of pettiness involved with Vince McMahon and the WWE's decision making. Hey, well, we don't like Brock Lesnar because he left. So we're going to make sure somebody else is the Youngest, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I know it what you're seems, saying. Seems silly, doesn't it? Yeah, it is silly. It is. It's very silly. Uh, I don't. I can't, I can't buy that one. Me either. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't buy that one. I mean, it makes a good story in the dirt sheets and so forth. Uh, good supposition, but I, I don't buy that, Conrad. Let's talk about a major topic that I know you had to be at the center of. It happened right around the same time as SummerSlam, where there is a new policy pushed out to the talent, and it's called a business casual dress code. The idea is wrestlers and other WWE personnel are now required to wear dress shoes, slacks, and a dress shirt to the matches every night. Coat and tie is optional. And... It's reported in the torch that management's goal here is to enhance the image of WWE to the outside world. They don't want wrestlers showing up to the arenas in track suits and flip flops and worn out t-shirts. And one wrestler was quoted to Wade as saying it had gotten pretty bad. And others would say that it's a minor inconvenience. 
Yes, it's less comfortable on flights and a hassle when changing after workouts at the gym, but it's just not a big deal. And someone from the office said, well, the wrestlers making a big deal out of this are just plain silly for guys who are making a lot of money. But I guess there was a talent meeting right before SummerSlam uh, at that Monday Night Raw where Edge and Chris Jericho and Molly Holly, they're all pretty outspoken. And it's Jericho's even described as being a bit crabby, saying that WWE is taking away their individuality. And he's asking, is Steve Austin going to be required to do the dress code? Because he wrestles in jean shorts and he makes appearances in jean shorts. Is he still allowed to wear that? I know you're in the middle of this. What do you remember about this often discussed dress code from the WWE? I'm just trying to clean up, uh, to clean up the image uh, so those guys look successful. Why do you think back in the day that uh, pro wrestlers in the territory era drove big cars? They did it for two reasons. Because most of their trips were by, by land. So those bigger cars, a Cadillac or a Lincoln, uh, so forth, uh, boded them well on their travel. It also spoke of their success. If you're at an arena and uh, you see one of your, one of the stars pull up in a caddy, you know, uh, all of a sudden guy must be doing really well. Success is, uh, evident. I think there's a lot to be said about that analogy as well. So I, I didn't ever have a problem with it because guys just let, they went too crazy on their flip flops and their Zubaz pants and their Gold's Gym t shirts. Uh, they, they didn't look special. They didn't look successful. And I think that's kind of where we were going to go is to upgrade the image of the, of the talent and, and increase their value. Increasing their value is a good thing. It's just, they had to change is always perceived this way. Conrad, as you know, in your business and so forth, when you have major changes, sometimes people react positively to those changes that are, that are being involved. And sometimes they just move on because all it is, I'm packing something different. I'm packing a pair of dress shoes. And if your feet hurt on the plane, take your shoes off. I don't know what to tell you. It's not a big deal, but guys, cause it's change. Made a big deal out of it, some of them. And uh, they could bitch and moan all they wanted, but it was never going to change. This is something Vince was committed to. Vince was a meticulous dresser. Uh, and no, nobody's asking you to dress like Vince with all custom made clothing, but uh, buying a pair of slacks. I've had wives come up to me and say, I'm so glad you guys changed that because, you know, it, it, it just makes my husband look more successful. The more successful he is perceived, uh, the better off we'll all be. Edge is uh, speaking out in this meeting saying, hey, if us wearing these clothes makes us look minor league and it's bad image wise for fans to see us like that, isn't it also bad image wise that we're supposed to be these WWE superstars, but we're sitting in coach famous actors and pro athletes. They don't ride in coach. They're in first class. And Molly Holly would say, Hey, we also look minor league when we're showing up to packed arenas, four or five in a compact rental car. Of course, none of that really goes anywhere. I know that they were aiming for more first class travel accommodations, but there's a theory. And again, this is uh, sour grapes. I'm sure here's what's written in the tours. There were some thoughts expressed in some circles of the locker room that since triple H has been dressing up to sell the image of evolution inspired by Ric Flair dressing up for decades to sell that high class image to fans who saw him outside the ring. He wanted everyone else to do the same. Boy, this whole reign of terror thing. It, the, it, had, the, nothing to, it, it had nothing to do with triple H. It's crazy. Yeah. It had nothing to do with it. It was convenient. It, it makes a nice argument, I guess. That's the case. That might be oxymoronic to talk about a nice argument. Uh, it's just to inc inc make the guys look better, look, look successful. That Cadillac illustration really fits that whole, this whole bullshit. Uh, look successful, be perceived as successful, and your career will be better off. You, ha you have more value. And why wouldn't you want to have more value in your daily uh, pursuit. These guys remember on the, on the road almost every day. So it wasn't like, you know, this is 
Well, now you see guys come to pay for these and they're, they're dressed accordingly. Some will, I can guarantee you at all in some guys will show up to work with a coat and tie. Yes. Not, that, not that they're told to, but they want to be perceived as a, as a, as a revenue generating pro athlete. And, uh, I think that's, it's interesting to me. Uh, I, I get a kick out of watching the NFL, uh, and seeing the talents, uh, are the players, I should say, show up with their fine duds on their Louis Vuittons and all these things. And I get it that, 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 that they make more money than most of the wrestlers. I get that. Not all of them, but most of them. So I, 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 I just, it was all for the talents. Good. But again, you're talking about a change. We're talking about change. So you know, know what I'm saying? Practice. That was your yeah. best Allen Iverson there. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about Johnny Ace because I think by this point, John Laurinaitis was heading up talent relations. And this is going to be one of his first major policies, the dress code thing. Um, looking back, I know that ultimately these are all decisions from Vince, but do you think that in an alternate universe, you would have passed down that same policy? I mean, would you have argued for the policy or against the policy if, if you were running talent relations at the moment? I'm for it. Yeah, I, I was for it. And, and I, maybe how it was presented, uh, was a little bit quick on the draw, but, uh, at the end of the day and the, and the big picture, uh, I was, I was all for it. Uh, all it's a matter of buying a pair of shoes and a pair of fucking slacks, Conrad and, and buying a dress shirt. Why is, as I said earlier, why is loved it? Because they could go shopping and get their husband out of gold gym shirts. And Zubas, uh, you ever wore Zubas, Conrad? No, as a kid, yeah, but uh, as an adult, no. But I do have friends who uh, who rock them every chance they get, and that's right. The result is a lot of wrestlers get fined. Seven wrestlers get fined almost immediately. Devon Dudley and Rey Mysterio are amongst them. I guess it's a five hundred dollar fine for the first offense, a thousand dollar fine for the second offense, and you're going to be suspended. Uh, after a third offense without pay. Yes. Without pay that got, that gets everybody's attention. You hate to go to that depth to make, to try to get some cooperation from everybody until they understand why you're doing it. You're not doing it to be a prick. You're not doing it to, uh, appease the wise who'd like to shop. You're doing it because it upgrades and makes your product look a little shinier, a little, a little bit more positive. And anything that we could do to enhance the perception of the stars is a, to me, a good thing. So, uh, it just was again, a change, uh, the, the error of our ways may have been that we rushed into it too quickly. We shouldn't have had anybody get fined, uh, that soon after the mandate of, of the change in, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the attire. Just not that big a deal. I'm sure there's some, some folks out there listening that didn't live through that era that are, are saying to themselves, are you shitting me? All this trouble and these fines and this discord over dress shoes, slacks, and a shirt. Really? That's where we are. So there's so many more important things to associate yourself with other than worrying about my attire. So uh, I, I just, it was funny in the beginning because guys had not used to, were not used to dressing that way. And they might've sent their wives or girlfriends out to shop for them. And they come back with shirts that would fit Andre. Uh, just, I don't know. This is silly to me. It's absolutely stupid. It shows the immaturity of a lot of guys. We, uh, we know that eventually it becomes, uh, a whole issue with a lot of talent. And Johnny Ace is also saying that now there's going to be a $250 fine for being late. So we're trying to uh, rule with maybe a more iron fist about the way our guys are presenting themselves and they're showing up on time. And I know that those seem like no brainers, but I think there's some frustration amongst the talent that, Hey, payoffs are down. Crowds are down. Houses are down. Fans aren't as in tune with our creative as they once were. And you're more concerned about what kind of shoes I'm wearing 
Like I could see why they might be frustrated with that. Could you? Oh yeah, kind of. But you know, yeah, it just work work through it. You know, buy your new shoes, buy your slacks. Try to be the best dressed guy in the locker room. Be be competitive about it. And uh, some guys were mature and competitive, and some guys are just crybabies. And there's just there's no case for you. You're going to lose the judge's verdict on this deal because this is what Vince wanted. He was very serious about this deal, and uh, and I don't blame him on this one here. I I wholeheartedly agree that again uh, to upgrade it. But Conrad, as I said, uh, all you're trying to do is enhance the image of one of your of your people, make them look more successful. Make them look like they're riding a Cadillac and they own a Cadillac or two. They weren't through that whole thing with Rolex watches. So, you know, Rolex is a mark of wealth and success. Ric Flair made promos about his watch for years. It yeah. seemed to work for him. We should also talk about, um, you know, where we are with, with wrestling today. Because I can't believe this is real, but as folks are listening to this, we're just a few days away from one of the biggest shows in wrestling history. One of the biggest shows you've ever been a part of. I'm talking about all in at Wembley over 50,000 tickets are out. I got to ask before a big show like this, is your preparation any different than a regular show? Can you take us through that? I'm going to call as best I know. Uh, through my conversation with TK, this guy's on the inside can use that kind of language, uh, with TK, uh, I, uh, Alex Marvez will be the guy that's providing me my notes. And a lot of it's just left up to me as far as what I use and what I don't use or how I use it. But yeah, there's more detail, uh, in, in, involved in it. I'm hopeful that I get all my paperwork from Alex before I leave and go on the road. So I have something tangible, uh, and and important to read and study. So yeah, I, I'll, I'll take it to the next level on this one. Uh, it's like, uh, I think my work with Will Ospreay and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, God damn, man, what's wrong with me? Uh, and, and Swerve shows you what you do when you, you get invested into a match. I think this match is going to take that to a whole different level. Uh, and the career versus the championship is a hell of a stipulation. Hell of a stipulation. So it'll be a great story to tell. It'll be physical. These guys will beat the shit out of each other. There's no doubt about that. And it's a match you can't call from the outside. Does Brian Danielson lose and retire? Uh, does, uh, swerve lose and, and become a former champion. Seems like that's some people's thought. I don't think it's time to take the title off swerve personally. He's just starting to get over and, uh, he's a good champion. I don't, I don't recall any of the agents or producers coming. Well, swerve was late again. We didn't, we didn't get, we didn't get to do as much in this match as we wanted to because the talent wasn't in the locker room. You don't have that issue with either one of these guys. And they both are very proud uh, uh, of their work. And they're both at key elements, key times in their career. So uh, I, I'm uh, really looking forward to that situation. And my friend Alex Marvez, who's uh, working for the company now on a full-time basis, uh, will come through like a champion, as he always does, and provide us with a, a outline of things. And then during the day, uh, I'll spend time with Excalibur for sure. And, uh, we'll go over it, what we're going to get in, what we're not going to get in, how you want to handle this, how you want to handle that. So, uh, but at the end of the day, the proof is in the old pudding, by the way, I had some great to banana pudding in Charlotte the other day. Uh, man, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. Uh, really good. I have my traditional pulled pork sandwich, the coleslaw and banana pudding, not together, but, uh, at, at a, at 
comfortable intervals. It's good stuff. So I, I think this is going to be a hell of a story that we're going to tell. I, I, I can see this being the match of the year for many promotion because both guys are smart. They're cerebral. They know what their game, they know what their in-ring skill sets, what the limits are, if, the, if there are any. Uh, so I'm excited about the call, being able to call this match. I appreciate Tony Khan having a faith in me to, to bring me over. I, I'm sure that I'll also be plenty of t- people watching. They'll say, boy, JR looks old. Hey, guess what? Einstein, I am old. What the fuck do you want? Uh, so I'm, I'm being a little bit of a turd, but and, and, and anyway, uh, it, it should be a classic and there's nothing on the card that could follow it. Uh, nothing. So it's going to go last. I'm sure I've been told that, but I can't imagine anything else going on last at Wembley, but, uh, Swerve defending his championship against uh, Brian Danielson. And as we look back over the years, I think we're going to say Conrad that this match was one of the crowning moments for both these guys career uh, for different reasons, but it was uh, all important for both of them to perform at the highest level that they humanly possibly can. And that's, I would accept nothing less if I were calling the shots. And I don't think it'll take much encouragement to, to achieve those goals should be an absolute masterpiece. And that's a lot to put on your plate. Hey, did you see the interview I did with Brian Danielson? I did. Did you like it? I loved it. I was uh, shocked when he broke the news that he was going to need neck surgery by the end of the year. Yeah. Kind of speaks to your Matt Hardy line earlier about Matt Hardy. Needing well, knee surgery. well, we'll but, see. I, uh, I, I'm not convinced that, that we all know what the finish is going to be here. And I'm going to be excited to see the payoff with Tony storm and Mariah may, and certainly I'm pumped to see MJF and will Osprey. The entire wrestling world will be watching this Sunday afternoon. It starts at 11 AM here in Alabama. So I'm going to have that smoker fired up and ready to go. And. Of course, I know what I'm going to be using. Some of that all-purpose seasoning I picked up from jrsbbq.com. It's good for what ails you. They got two types <laughs> of barbecue sauce. They got their own new hot sauce. The all-purpose seasonings my go-to. But they've even got main event mustard, chipotle ketchup, and the brand new book. It's all available along with trading cards and action figures. There's something for everybody at jrsbbq.com. That's right, and it's still we're in the heart of grilling season. I don't know that we ever get out of grilling season, but uh, with football season here it, imminent, uh, you know, the college season starts, I think Saturday, LSU, uh, playing, uh, who are they playing? They're playing, uh, somebody in, in Ireland. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. This weekend we've got, um, it's kind of a big deal. Florida state is going to be playing a game right. in Ireland at, uh, right. on Saturday at 11 AM. How about that? That's, it's going to be good. So it kicks everything off. We're all excited about it. I know my, my buddies in Oklahoma are curious, anxious to see what, how the Sooners do in the SEC. Uh, now what's the expectations? You know, should we expect 10 wins? And probably not. But maybe we, could, maybe we should. Maybe they pull off some surprises. Uh, but uh, grilling and football go together magnificently. So I'm excited about that a lot. And, uh, I'll be in London finding a TV that carries the game. Cause it's, I, even though I'm not a Florida state alum or fan, yay or nay of them and, uh, LSU, but LSU is a potential future opponent of the Sooners and the SEC. And, uh, I was surprised the other day to see how high this, the Crimson Tide were ranked in a preseason. That's pretty damned impressive for that new coach and his staff. He did just, you read about did you read about where this lady got I think it's a lady, got eight hundred and eighty five thousand dollars salary from Alabama as a recruiting person? Yeah, I could they, believe that. That's amazing, man. I mean, good for her. Good for or him or whatever. I think it's a lady. I thought it was a guy, but eight twenty five well, years what I read. But either way. I'm surprised you're surprised that Alabama's ranked highly. Like, you know, that he's got a lot well, of Saban's kids and you know that he just went to the championship game last year. He had as many first rounders go to the NFL as Saban did. Like, 
Why are you sleeping on DeBoer? You need that Oklahoma ass whipped later this season? Is that what you want? Maybe so. Yeah, maybe so. I'll, that game's going to be in Norman too, by the way. Yeah, we'll we'll stomp ass, you know, ha, have whoop ass, <laughs> we'll travel. You know, we're going to walk it dry and all that. Every cliche you can think of. All that. It's going to be yeah, a lot of fun. I, we, JR and I have been looking forward to Oklahoma being in the SEC since it was first announced. We used right. to fantasy book this, and now it's going to happen. We hope you'll hang around with us this year and enjoy some uh, some football conversation. But, boy, we're going to have a lot to talk about next week on the heels of All In. One last time, order this pay-per-view. If you can make it, you should go see it. It's wrestling history. Don't take it for granted. You want to be able to say that you were there at Wembley Stadium. Tickets are on sale now at AEWTIX.com. I know there's a Ticketmaster link and a Live Nation link, but by God, you can also get it from AEWTIX.com. But I'm ordering the pay-per-view. I'll be doing that with Triller. I know that they've got it on cable and satellite. You can see it at Dave and Buster's nationwide. Hell, you can even order it on YouTube or DAZN. It's anywhere you enjoy wrestling, pay-per-view. You don't want to miss this weekend. AEW always delivers on pay-per-view. I know this will be no exception. They're going to have a great show, and you don't want to miss JR doing what he does best at uh, one of the biggest shows of all time. Order the doggone pay-per-view. Be a part of wrestling history. You know, Conrad, I got to be honest about my future. Uh, at my age, two health concerns that are being uh, addressed and they're getting better, by the way. Uh, I, uh, I don't know how many more great opportunities like this that I'll have to uh, do what I love doing in front of 50,000. It's just, it's hard to believe from the Irish and Neil Boys Club in Shreveport with 100 people there. To, to this on this in this new promotion and, and what Tony Khan has done with AEW is nothing short of extraordinary. And I know that he's a public figure and I know that some people don't like the creative, but uh, I can tell you this, it's always been that way. It's always been that way since those figured it out that this is showbiz and that the, the, the finishes, the outcomes, the endings, are, are, uh, staged people just, uh, it's just, a uh, it's amazing to me how that works out. So, uh, I'm excited about this opportunity. I look at it as an opportunity, a 72 year old guy who looks old. And, and the reason for that is by God, he is, uh, is getting an opportunity to do what he truly loves. And we have to be realistic. And someday we'll look, maybe look back on this. You know, Jr. said one time on a podcast that he didn't know how many more of these he had in him. Well, physically, I got plenty, but I don't know. I can't. Mother Nature has her own way of doing business. So I want to make the most of this opportunity. And I look at it as a genuine opportunity for a, a veteran like me to be able to do what he does and go call that one massive match that is so important to both the talents involved uh, I'm, I'm very excited and honored about the opportunity. I like swerve. I like Brian. Uh, they're good for the wrestling business. They're going to work their ass off. They're going to be physical when they lock up. There's one way to, to start this process. When those two cats lock up, look at the stiffness and the snugness, as they say, uh, cause they're going to bring it. They're going to bring everything. And it starts with a lockup. What I'm trying to say. It starts with you ordering the doggone pay-per-view. Do it now. Be a part of wrestling history. Hear JR in one of his last great main event matches. Uh, you don't want to miss it. All in AEW this Sunday. We're going to be talking about it next week, and we'll talk about SummerSlam from 1999 next week right here on Grilling JR. And don't forget, check us out and support us at grillingjr.com, your, hall, your home for all things JR. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on the notifications bell. We're going to be going live, and you don't want to miss us at grillingjr.com. Jim, I had a blast today. Thanks for all the time. It's fun to talk about SummerSlam, and I hope you have a safe trip across the pond. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate seeing you again and all your hard work on, on our behalf. Uh, looking forward to this weekend. It's a bucket list weekend for me, and uh, it, couldn't come, it couldn't not come quick enough. So 
I hope you guys will tune in, buy the pay-per-view, join us, and uh, let's have a hell of a show, hell of a weekend, and have fun. It's all about having fun. This shit ain't rocket science. No. Come on. Pro wrestling. Enjoy it. So, Conrad, thanks. Have a good weekend. And I know you want to say Roll Tide, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll say Boomer Sooner, and we'll both live happily ever after. Roll Tide and amen to that. We'll see you next week. So long, everybody. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders plus new series like the book with David Crockett, Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early. You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch alongs, Q and A's and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And Hey, when you do the first week is completely free Adfreeshows.com. <laughs>